Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Many times people talk about dreams, having dreams, and they want to have them interpreted. Or realize something. When one receives a dream that is from God, and most dreams are not, it is rare. But when one receives a dream from God, let me tell you, there is a revelation from Him. You know the implication to it. And therefore, what we're seeing here in the New Covenant, when this angel of the Lord speaks to individuals, they never receive an interpretation, do you? No, what they receive is truth from God and wise ones, they submit to it. Well, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 2, and let's uh, pick up in verse 13. We began that last week with the Magi, these wise men, these sages of Israel, that then being warned in a dream not to go and speak to Herod again, but to go back to their own country, which they did. And we see, look down to verse 13, and as they withdrew, behold, the angel Lord was manifested in a dream to Yosef. And this angel spoke, saying, Rise up. Now here again, it is in a, a construction that speaks about being made to rise up. What does that tell us? That God is empowering Yosef, that God is supplying him. And that's why I said last week, when you are submissive to God, when you are hearing His voice through His Word, through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, through some, some revelation of God, when you submit to it, you can expect God to provide, God to move in your life. And this is what the Scripture is loudly proclaiming to the reader, saying, uh, get up, take the child and his mother and flee into Egypt and remain there until which I will speak to you. Now, what's he saying here? See, Yosef and his mother, they are unaware of the danger that they're in. We know that King Herod knows something. He knows that Messiah has been born, that he's in the region of Bethlehem. Secondly, he knows the approximate time that Messiah was born. They wanted to know exactly, but he knows approximately. And now what is he doing? Well, we're going to see. He is going to send forth those to put the child to death. But realize something. When we study, for example, the book of Esther, there's a principle that Judaism teaches. You see, Esther was in place on the throne as queen, Queen Esther, before any discussion of that wicked Haman is mentioned. And the principle that Judaism gives is this. Before God allows the disease to come, he gives the medicine first. Meaning God's provision for success, for victory, for deliverance is there long before the enemy rears his ugly head. And the same thing is happening now. Before King Herod gives these commands, we find that the angel is already at work. He knows, God knows all things and he instructs his angels. So the angels commands and say, flee, taking the boy and his mother, flee into Egypt and remain there until I should tell you. For Herod is about to send, very important, this word, mele in Greek, it means that which will be, that is about to take place. So King Herod is about to seek the child to destroy him, verse 14. 
and he was risen, meaning God supplied the power, the means, everything for him to rise up and to take the child and his mother by night and to withdraw into Egypt. And he was there until the death of Herod in order that should be fulfilled the word of the Lord by the prophet saying out of Egypt I called my son now that is from the book of Hosea that is the book of Hosea many years ago on this broadcast we studied the book of Hosea going through that entire prophecy and if you look at chapter 11 verse 1 there's that prophecy but does it really speak about Messiah? No. It speaks about Israel, the people that went down in Egypt. Well, what happened there? God moved for redemption. They were brought up because of redemption. And now what we see here is that Messiah is going to go down to Egypt and he is going to be called up from Egypt to fulfill the prophecy out of Egypt I called my son what is this to tell the reader very simply that Messiah is coming for the purpose of redemption we have to learn how to interpret Scripture correctly take that context the Jewish people coming out of Egypt being set free from bondage that was Israel Messiah demonstrates that same thing but what brought them out redemption why is Messiah coming out of Egypt into the land of Israel? For the purpose of redemption. And realize something else. There's also another message, and that is to show the close relationship between Yeshua and Israel. That is what God commanded Israel to do. Fortunately, our people didn't do it. Messiah is going to bring about. So, good news in this verse that's what it's trying to say here once more look at the end of verse 15 this was all in order to fulfill the word by the Lord through the prophet saying out of Egypt I called my son verse 16 then Herod seeing that he was mocked or deceived now it literally means to to be made fun of that's how he thought of it by the wise men he became exceedingly angry and he sent to murder all the boys of Bethlehem and in all the regions round about her from those who are two years and under according to the time which he had discerned, there's that same word, to mean to investigate, to research something with great care and thoroughness. According to the time that he had discerned from the Magi. And all of this came about, why? Then fulfilled the word by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, and this is found in Jeremiah chapter 31. What's that prophecy? Where it says, a voice in Ramah is heard. Now, this has to do, and we'll see this in a moment, this has to do with Rachel, Rachel. But notice, I would encourage you to read this section, which begins Jeremiah 31, I believe verses 15, 16, and 17, at least in the Hebrew Bible, verses 15, 16, and 17. And there it speaks about this happening, but it says, that there is a great significance for the last days. In fact, let me just look at it very quickly. Going to Jeremiah chapter 31. Didn't plan on doing it, but it's such a wonderful passage of Scripture. Jeremiah 31. Notice what, what the Scripture says, beginning with verse 15. Thus said the Lord, the voice in Ramah is heard, lamentations and bitter weeping, Rachel, she cries concerning her sons. Now, what sons? This is prophetic. Her sons are fine, but she's dying. And with death, according to the Jewish tradition, oftentimes there's revelation. Now remember that. You can discern the own implications of that, but traditionally in Judaism, prior to someone's death, they are giving great revelation. 
Now that's a tradition. This is one hint of it in the scripture. And she refuses to be comforted concerning her children because they were not. This tells her she's at a place in Ephrata, near Bethlehem. This same location of what we're talking about, where Messiah was born. And there there's crossroads that lead out of Israel. And it was on these very roads that the people went into exile, Babylon in captivity. And she had a prophecy of that. And she was weeping about the death that took place during the time of Nebuchadnezzar. And now we're seeing a similar occurrence of death and slaughter in in Matthew chapter 2. But I want you to go down, if you would, to verse 16. It says, Thus says the Lord, refrain from your voice from crying and your eyes from tears. Why? For there is a sahar, an outcome, a reward. for for this activity, declares the Lord. For they will return from the land of uh, their enemy, speaking about redemption. For there's hope when? At the end. Very important. That same word, acharit, here it's in the second person plural, your end, meaning the end of this age. The people will return, meaning your sons will return to their borders. So it speaks about what's going to happen in the last days and how Messiah is part of that. That he's going to be the one that brings it about. Let's go back to the text. It says here, look again, verse 16. Then Herod, seeing that he had been mocked by the wise men, he became exceedingly angry. He sent a murder for a murder of all the children of those in Bethlehem and the regions around her, those two years and less, according to the time that he carefully discerned from the wise men. And this was to fulfill the word of Jeremiah that we just read, saying, a voice in Ramah is heard, lamentation and crying, and here in the Greek it says, and great grief. Why? Middle of verse 18. Rachel cries for her children that they, and she did not want to be comforted. Why? Because they are not. So notice again how frequently we see Matthew choosing Old Testament prophecy in order for us to rightly understand this New Testament uh, revelation. It's all very clear. Verse 19. And Herod, having died, behold, the angel Lord in a dream was manifested to Yosef in Egypt, saying, Be risen, that is, rise up, take the boy, the child, and his mother, and go into the land of Israel. For those who sought the life of the child are dead. Verse 21. And one of the things we see repeatedly is how Yosef, and this goes back to what it says earlier about him, that he was righteous. Why? He responded, and this is what the scripture is saying, he responded to the revelation of God. Everything that he heard, that he knew, this is God. This is a commandment from him. What did he do? He responded in obedience. Verse 21. And he rose up, he took the child and his mother, and he went into the land of Israel. But he heard that Archelos, the king, was ruling over Judah in place of Herod, his father. And when he heard it's the same family, the scripture says he was made afraid about this and he was afraid there to go. But uh, being warned in a dream, he withdrew into the regions of Galilee. Now, notice, he didn't go back to Bethlehem. Why? He wasn't from there. He was from the Galilee, and he went back to that spot. Why? Here again, all of this has one purpose, and that is to fulfill prophecy. When you read Matthew's Gospel, everything that's happening is a prophetic fulfillment. And that's why 
if you're really serious about knowing God, knowing His Word, understanding His truth, and applying it to your life, then you are going to be interested in prophecy. I'm speaking about biblical prophecy. Books such as Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and those what we call the minor prophets, not because they're minor in significance, but because they're shorter in length. This is something that we need to emphasize and read and pour over so that we have a right understanding. So we read, verse 22, that Joseph was afraid when he heard this one, Archelaus, was ruling over Judah. And he, having been warned in a dream, he withdrew into the regions of Galilee. And it says, and he came and he dwelt in a city, a specific city called Nazareth. So there was to fulfill the word through the prophet. What prophet? Well, we know the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 11, that he should be called a Nazri, a Nazri. Now, why do I say that? Well, it's very important. See, all of this has to do with him being called a certain name because he was dwelling in a certain place. What place? Nazareth. Now, this is vital that you see something here because Nazareth, well, remember what I've said so frequently. Every name has meaning. And the term Nazareth comes from a Hebrew word which means to, to basically guard something. It is a synonym according to what we see in the Proverbs and the Psalms. So much of the Proverbs and the Psalms are Hebrew poetry. And Hebrew poetry is discerned by its chief characteristic, which is parallelism, meaning things are likened to one another. And they use synonyms like leaders and kings. Or, or wisdom and knowledge. These two things are similar. And they agree in, in grammatical form as well. So we don't make mistakes in understanding the message of Hebrew poetry. And Hebrew poetry is oftentimes prophetic. And what we learned here is this, this word that the town Nazareth comes from means to watch, to guard, to keep. And it's also understood as a refusal, a refusal to the things of this world. It's refusing temptation. And we're going to see that's exactly what's going to happen. Understand, next week we're going to go into chapter 3 and we're going to see that Messiah is going to go into the wilderness and he's going to be tempted. And he is going to say to everything, everything that Satan says, he's going to say no. He's going to reject. And this comes along from the fact that he's going to be known as a Nutsri. That is one who says no to the things contrary to the will of God. Why? This word means to guard, to keep, to watch, to obey the commandments of God. Now, here's what I want to point out. Many times when we look at pictures, painting artwork of Yeshua, he is given long hair. He didn't have long hair. People say, well, it says right here, does it not that he's a Nazarene? No. It's not the word Nazarene. It's from the word Nazareth. Now, there's a difference. In Hebrew, there's two very different but, but similar letters. We have the Sade. The Sade is enunciated as a T-Z. Nazrat, we call it in Hebrew for Nazareth. Nazrat. It's not Nazir, but it is Nazrat. So we see something. People are confused. They hear that and they don't realize that it has to do with a different letter in the place called Nazrat or Nazareth, which is a Sade. They, because in Greek there is not that letter. And they use another letter that is like a Z. In Hebrew, we have a, a Zion. But it's not a Zion, it's a Sade. Now, here's what happens. They read this and they say, well, a, a Nazarene, but this is not a Nazarene. 
It's not from that vow that we read about in the book of Numbers in chapter 6. It's a different word entirety. So Yeshua didn't have long hair. He was not a Nazarite. He drank wine, the fruit of the vine. We see that. So this is another example of what happens when people don't look at the original language. They make foolish and silly mistakes. Well, look again at what the scripture says. Being warned in a dream, he withdrew into the region of Galilee. And he came and he dwelt in a city called Nazareth or Nazareth, so that should be fulfilled the word through the prophet. What prophet? That is Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 11, that great prophecy where it speaks about, and let's look at that very briefly. We see here in uh, Isaiah chapter 11, let's turn there, and look at what the prophecy says, because you may be surprised. In fact, I would encourage you, look all, all of this 11th chapter. It's a wonderful messianic prophecy concerning Messiah. But I just want us to look at the first, the first verse. We read, I'm in Kings, Isaiah chapter 11, and we find this prophecy that uh, Isaiah gave to us, where it says, A twig shall go forth from the stump of Yeshai. Now, we talked about three weeks ago about how Messiah's genealogy that he is a son of David, and David's father was Jesse. So, Yeshai or Jesse, it gives us that Davidic household. It's a reference to Messiah again. And a twig or a shoot or a little branch shall go forth from the stump of Yeshai. And here's his, Netzer, a, a shoot from his root will flourish, will blossom. So it's a messianic hope concerning the promise that God made to David concerning Messiah. And it says, and upon this one shall land the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. And as I say, we need to just go and read all of this 11th chapter to understand the significance of why Messiah is called a Netzer or a Nutsri, why he is one that's going to perfectly complete, say yes to God and no to the enemy. And that, as I said, is exactly where we're going next week. When we see Messiah having been born, having been taken to Nazareth, so we have an understanding of his identity, his character. See, when we have this statement saying to fulfill the word of the prophet that he's a Nazri, we should go to Isaiah. And we're going to see how and why he was taken to that city, that he grew up there until a time. And what was that time? Until God revealed to him this call to begin his ministry. Ministry at what age? At the age of 30. Or 30, and we see this in Luke chapter 3, that it was exactly at the age of 30 that Messiah began his ministry. Why? 30 has to do with death. That he's going to die. Why is that so important? Because he's the Redeemer. And there is no redemption without the shedding of blood. So when we look at this scripture, we see so much being revealed in just a few words concerning the identity of Messiah, how he's going to behave, his character, and here's the key, what's going to be accomplished through his life, his ministry. And let me begin to conclude this study by saying that God wants to do many things in your life. He wants to move as well. He'll give you revelation. You will be amazed what will take place in your life if you say, enough with my thoughts, enough with my desires. God, I am surrendering to you.
I confess my sin. I trust in Messiah's death, the shedding of his blood. I believe that he died, but on the third day he rose again, and I invite him into my life. When you do that and you say, I want to do your will, everything is going to change. God will most definitely give you a new perspective for your life. You'll see things differently. You'll have different desires and you will begin to become a recipient of God's provision. You will see Him moving, directing, providing, giving what you need in order to fulfill His will. And you will see how faithful God is, how He is full of faithfulness to provide exactly what He said He would do. God will not leave you, he will not forsake you and he will not disappoint you. He is going to be the source of a life. What type of life? Well, as Messiah said, he says, I come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And you're not going to know that life of fullness, that life that satisfies, that life that is a life of, of assurance and confidence and satisfaction until you humble yourself, until you surrender to the revelation of this book. And you might say, well, I feel so inadequate. You know what? When I look at the scripture and read these pages, I see person after person, man after man, woman after woman that God used, and they all felt so inadequate. Probably the best example of that is Moses. How he said, God, just, just send someone else. But Moses received God's provision, a provision for everything. Even when the children of Israel stood up and rose up against him to stone him, God delivered him out of their hands. No, Moses, you think he has any regrets for serving God? He does not. In fact, no one who has served God, who has taken his word, his revelation, applied it to their life, no one ever regrets doing so and neither will you humble yourself trust him believe his word apply it to your life and be ready for an adventure that god will move you lead you guide you into things you would have never imagined and he will give you that peace that passes all understanding all through that journey well once more our time has ended until next week when we continue on in Matthew chapter 3 and we see Messiah's overcoming the temptation of the enemy. Until then, Shalom. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.